So when looking at the heart, you have two portions we care about. We have our base and our apex. If you look at the base, the base will have all the major blood vessels rising in a superior, superior from the base of the center of the heart. And at the other end of the heart, you will encounter a football-like ending called the apex. We refer to that as a pointed tip. And this is going to come up again. The word apex always typically implies a pointed tip. The mediastinum, we learned about this cavity, this central cavity that exists between the lungs. And it's if we look at our apex, again, that apex is leaning more towards the left-hand side of the body. And we can see our major vessels going upwards. And the only thing to really add here, we zoom in on that cavity. What was the cavity around the heart called? Right? Let this remind you. The pericardial cavity. What was the wall that's the most outer wall called? Parietal pericardium. And what's the most inner wall called? visceral pericardium. So if we examine the parietal layer of the pericardium, and anybody remember what this word serous is coming from? What's inside of this cavity? Serous fluid. So there's a fluid inside that helps lubricate this heart as it beats da on its, da on its uh, daily, and it's made out of areolar tissue. And does anybody remember what mesothelia was? What category of epithelia it was? I'll give anybody a point extra credit if they remember. What is mesothelia? It's also similar with endothelia. What class of tissue was it? Let me hear it loudly and clearly. It is epithelial tissue, but anybody remember what it was? Five, oh, what was that? Squamous what? Fit squamous what? <laughs> nope, it's over now. It's over now. It is so over now. But okay, let's go back. Let's take it slow. Oh, I do want to go slow here. Let's see, let's see. Everyone always forgets. So when we were on our epithelial chapter... We learned about, dang it, I just passed it. We learned about mesothelium and endothelia, and it was a simple squamous tissue. Even in our notes, this one's going to come back again to haunt us. Endothelium, which is spelled wrong in my notes right there. Endothelium was the simple squamous, that is that inner lining within blood vessels. It was just a simple line of cells. And so if you find it in blood vessels, which we're going to see today in a second, it is called endothelia. If you see it on the lining of cavities, then it's mesothelia, a simple squamous tissue. So you've technically already learned this. And so that's what the mesothelia is. It's a simple squamous tissue. Whoops, squamous tissue. A simple line of cells. And you can see all that simple line. Here's one cell, second cell, third cell, all in one simple arrangement. Anybody remember what cells comp compromise or make up areolar tissue? That make the collagen and the elastic there? Fibrocytes or fibroblasts. Nice. And so that parietal layer is made out of things that you already know, areolar tissue and mesothelia, full circle from the first week of school, right? And that pericardial cavity inside of it is pericardial fluid, or otherwise you already know it as serous fluid. You will occasionally see this outer parietal layer or this component of it called the fibrous pericardium. The fibrous pericardium. And I should actually clarify on that. You know, when you think about this outside, there's one confusion, confusing thing about parietal and visceral layer that's simply making it very easy just to understand. Like you don't have to like really understand, even know these words. Outer wall, inner wall. But there's one more wall, and that's what makes the heart so confusing because it has three layers you care about. First, 
Fibrous pericardium is its own division. So let's put some numbers on these things. One, fibrous pericardium. Then we have two, we have our parietal layer, which is comprised of areolar tissue and mesothelia, which is just these two layers there. And then we have our third wall, which is going to be on this side. You can see they kind of cut it there. I'm not really seeing it written, but you can see this wall, the most inner wall. We're going to draw our own label. The most inner one here is called the visceral pericardium. So three walls we care about, visceral, parietal, and then lastly, fibrous pericardium, which is not the same thing as the parietal layer. And nothing else that we don't know. The only thing I'm just going to say is um, I'm going to add this that's not on my notes, pericarditis. When someone has pericarditis, this means that there's an inflammation of the pericardial cavity, pericarditis. Itis is Latin usually for inflammation, so pericardi is saying an inflammation in the pericardial cavity. And this is a very common, uh, I guess, occurrence. Uh, heart issues are common, the number one killer of um, men in the United States, so I kind of feel like this is all something you're going to have to just be familiar with. And so if there's swelling in this cavity, it can disrupt the contraction or the beating of the heart. And so pericarditis can be caused for, um, an infect by an infection. Anything else I'm missing? That's really all I care for you to know there. Mm -mm -mm. Yes. And let's move on. Oh, last thing to add. Let's add our numbers here. One and then here we had our two layers. Our outer, outer parietal layer is going to be wall number two. And then we have one more that's not written here, but it's the inner serous layer. What's the inner layer called? Visceral. So that should be here as well. I just don't know why it's not, but it should be visceral. So when we refer to the parietal, as you've learned it in anatomy, the serous cavity is the parietal layer and the visceral layer. That's the serous pericardium made up of those two layers, the parietal and the visceral. And then on the most outer layer, the most superficial layer, you have your fibrous pericardium. And that's really all there is to add. Now, blood vessels in general are pretty easy to learn. When we look at our blood vessels, just at a glance, looking at a microscope slide, you can always see that an artery will have a thicker, muscular, smooth muscle layer embedded within it, and it tends to create a nice circular layer. And so this circular, this circular artery, or sorry, this circle, more circular shape will always be indicative of an artery. And then the vein always looks a little sad. And just to give you a, a little perspective too, we have something called a jugular vein. And where did we hear the word jugular in the skull before? The jugular, what was that opening called? Jug there was a jugular notch, but also a jugular foramen. And the jugular foramen, didn't it sort of have that shape a little bit? And so you can see that veins do have a more sort of droopier uh, like shape compared to the artery, which is more consistent circle. And there's a reason for this, and we'll get to that in a second. And so, intima. Tunic, the word tunic implies, like, have you ever been to, like, a toga party? You know how you wear the the outer like covering a tunic is like a layer of clothing like right now like a uh, back in the day they would wear these wraps and then they would have a belt and they can wear one under they can wear one over and so tunic is like saying a layer and so intima like intimate means like really deep and close to you right so intima is like saying intimate let that remind you of the most inner or the internal layer the most inner layer intima 
It's made up of typically endothelial cells, which is that other simple squamous cells. What were simple squamous cells really good at if for the, in the body? What was their function? Gas exchange. And what, did, what do blood cells deliver? Oxygen. So we can see why we need simple squamous in a lot of these places and to have good oxygen exchange. And I will get to this point. Let's do it with our figure, though, in a bit. And then we have our tunica media, which is going to be the middle layer. And it's going to be made up of smooth muscle, which has the ability to contract and relax, just like skeletal muscles that you learned in your previous exam. When the muscles have contracted, when those sarcomeres are contracted, you expect those blood vessels to decrease in diameter. We refer to that as vasoconstriction. Vasodilation, just like dilation of your pupils. When your pupils are very dilated, it means that they've gotten larger. Vasodilation implies that they're increasing in diameter. And we'll also talk about this with the figure in a second, but you're going to see that we have two elastic membranes that form boundaries, but it's just easier with a figure. And then lastly, we have our tunica externa, which is going to be our most outer layer. This is going to be made out of connective tissue, making sure that it's bound to any structures so that the vessels aren't just flopping around and floating around. They're strictly bound to where they need to be. And so that outermost connective tissue keeps it anchored to structures in the body. Anchors vessels to surrounding tissues. And that will be our tunica externa. And so back to these, is that we require a lot of elasticity in these blood vessels, and even more so in some blood vessels versus others. If we think just very simply now, and I'm going to go ahead and just see if I can find an image with... If it, I guess that's coming in on Thursday. But if we look at an image of blood vessels in general, these large blood vessels, they need a lot of elasticity because this heart pumps blood directly into them with a lot of force. And it has to send it through all the arteries throughout the entire body. And so these, these vessels need a lot of elasticity. So what we encounter in these layers is that we encounter a lot of elastic fibers which allow for expansion. So if we're looking at our figure, starting one by one, we have our tunica intima, which is going to be that inner layer, the inner layer, you might want to bracket here to make it easier, but the inner layer where we have once more that endothelia cells. And then on the inside, we have a very stretchy elastic membrane called the internal elastic membrane. And then we moved on to our tunica media, which contains those smooth muscles involved in vasoconstriction and dilation. You can see them all here. And then if we look at the external elastic membrane, it's going to be the boundary between the tunica media and the tunica Externa. So it's going to be this one here. It's not very prominently highlighted, but it's this one. The boundary in between those two regions. And all of that contributes to keeping the shape of your arteries or veins in their original shape, no matter what's going on. Whether blood is pumping fast or slow, it helps them just maintain their overall integrity. And keep in mind... These layers exist in not just the artery, they also exist in the vein. But as you can see, again, they're different in appearance. And if you look at the layers, you can see that there's a major difference in the amount of smooth muscle when you compare the artery to the vein. You'll see that the smooth muscle is much more larger than it is in the vein. And so, if we think about the overall body as a whole, you want to think about a flow from the heart 
Like if we're thinking about these red blood cells now, you're always thinking about one red blood cell as we move forward. And it's, as it's exiting the heart, it got it has oxygen now. And that oxygen, it wants to leave through the arteries. So it goes through the arteries, these large ones here. These large ones are categorized as elastic arteries. Elastic arteries. And that's because, again, they require an extensive amount of elasticity to withstand all the pressure from the heart that the heart is exerting on them as it's pushing blood through these blood vessels. Now, when you look at the rest of the body, right, if you're here at the heart and these blood vessels, they need to travel all the way down to the limbs. They need to travel down all the way to the muscles, all the way down to the foot. So down there, they don't require as much elasticity as the ones that are directly connected to the heart. So what you have to imagine is sort of a different a highway of things changing, where you start off with elastic, elastic, they're very expansive. And then as you progress further, like say to the arm, these elastic ones start changing into what we refer to as muscular arteries. They become not so elastic because they don't really need to be. And so they're much more medium sized, and their job is to distribute to all the rest of the body, right? They left the elastic ones, they transformed into muscular ones, and now they're going to be responsible for delivering that rich oxygen blood to all of these muscles that we're going to learn about this next week in lab. And so muscular arteries deliver it there. Now, the exchange site. We touched on this a little bit while ago when we talked about interstitial fluid last week. And when these, our red blood cell has made its way all the way down to say, let's uh, keep it simple. What did we learn in lab? Thursday hasn't done lab yet, right? So now let's keep it simple. So the blood cell is traveling through this muscular artery. And then eventually, let's say now it actually has to drop off that oxygen onto the muscle. It has to drop it off to an organ. That oxygen is finally needs to be delivered. And so what you have to imagine is that every organ that you've seen in lab, whether it's been like just looking at the model and you look at a liver, you look at a kidney, you look at a small intestine, you look at any organ in the body, the exchange occurs at capillaries. Capillaries. This is where these red blood cells, they'll be traveling through this little segment and they're carrying around oxygen and then they let go of that oxygen this is too large, one sec. So these red blood cells, once more, are traveling, traveling, traveling. I'm going to put a little positive in there to indicate that they have oxygen. They're oxygenated, oxygenated. And then these red blood cells, as they make their way to the other side, I'm going to write negative and negative and negative and negative because now they're deoxygenated. And so what happened is that in their process of traveling from one end to the other, they drop off their oxygen. And at the same time, if they drop off oxygen, what are they probably picking up? Carbon dioxide, CO2. And so now they make the exchange there. They drop off their oxygen. Those heme groups that we talked about with iron, they can also bind, bind to CO2. And so when they drop off oxygen, those same cells pick up CO2. And now it's going to have its job now. We have to think about like logically now. If we dropped off our oxygen, these red blood cells, where do they want to go to get reoxygenated? What system is responsible for oxygenation of red blood cells? Respiratory. And what's two organs that are responsible for in res or the major players of resp respiratory? The lungs. So all of this wants to come back to the lungs eventually. And no matter what organ it's serving, it's going to travel back now. And let's make sure I didn't skip any terms here. At this capillary site where the exchange occurs, the part that's still part of the artery system is called arterial. Or whenever you add the I-O-L in front of anything, you're going to see the word bronchus, and then you're going to see the word bronchial on Thursday, if not next Tuesday. And so that usually means smaller. So it's like saying artery, but E-O in Latin means to, it's a small artery, arterial. So this first segment, right before you hit that capillary bed, this exchange site, is going to be called an arterial. And something that makes them a little bit different is that they actually don't have like a tunica externa or prominent one. They do have smooth muscles and endothelia, but they're really small and they're missing those 
overall structures that you would see on the regular arteries. And so we will come back to this point probably when we come back on Thursday. But I, this is just because uh, at this site, every organ has different requirements. And for example, let's actually let's keep going on that point, actually. When we look at this capillary bed, if we zoom in on it, right, this is the same arterial. It's in red. This red one that's traveling through here, this is your arterial. The red blood cells, their objective is to deliver their oxygen and then go into the venules or the system of the veins, which we'll talk about a little more in detail. But again, we're in the arterioles, and then they drop it off, all the oxygen, to these cells, and then they return CO2 back into the circulation. And this is how plasma delivers its nutrients as well. All the nutrients are exchanged at the capillaries. I love to use oxygen and CO2 because it's the example we've been holding on to since the beginning of the semester. But now you have to imagine to yourself that everything that's flowing through plasma is flowing through these capillaries. So the nutrients, it doesn't matter if it's your kidneys, it doesn't matter if it's a muscle cell, it doesn't matter what cells it is, not only is oxygen being exchanged, but so are all those yummy nutrients you've learned about. Lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, they're all going to be exchanged at the capillaries. So every organ is served by a capillary bed every single one and where i am in the class today on is that you see these continuous capillary fenestrated capillary sinusoid capillaries all it is is that when you examine this capillary bed the portion the portion of exchange is that some organs have a much large a requirement for a different type of capillary and simply speaking where i'll put a pin in where we're going to leave off is that the liver really wants to process everything. So it has huge openings, huge openings. And if you compare it to the other ones, this one has slight openings with more pores in it. And then this one has almost no pores and it's just continuous. So every single organ just has different requirements of exchange. And I'll leave it off on that. And we get back, that's pretty much the end of capillaries. And then we get into the heart. And I may have to move your exam to the, not to one more Tuesday, so not this coming Thursday, but the following Tuesday. So I'll update your schedule with that to match where we're at right now. So, so the good news is that as you see,